Gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley Starting in Business Builder Brand Blog. This one, big number 309, and I have a bit of a car conundrum. I got my new car, got it the other day. I love, I love the new car. Anyway, here's the deal. I want to show you and talk about it a little bit, but I also really want you to watch the video this coming Thursday that I'm going to be posting on my Alpha M YouTube channel where I actually like vlog the whole process of dropping it off, picking it up, doing a little tour. So what do I do? Do I show you a little bit of the car now and just say, you know what, you got to watch the whole video to really get the full reveal? Or do I show you and then you won't watch it? What do I, okay, so here, here's what we'll do. If you promise to watch the vlog this coming Thursday on the Alpha M YouTube channel, I'm going to show you a little bit of this car, all right? Then I want to talk about one thing that I learned from Travis, my sales guy, about, we're from this, my sales guy. Come with me. All right, so these are the wheels. The size, they're 22s. As you can see, blacked out rims, kind of sexy. Went with the red calipers. I just thought it was a little bit different and I didn't want a mom car. Cause here's the interesting thing. If you actually Google search mom car 2021, this car that I got is actually one of four that they list. And when I got the car from Travis, I'm like, yo Travis, I didn't realize, but I was buying a mom car. He goes, there aren't many mom cars with 22s. And that made me feel a little better. Honestly, I don't care. Mom car, whatever. If I could have actually gotten a minivan, that's what I would have done because I don't care about street cred at this point. The grill, all black. I got the uh, M package on the car just to make it a little bit sexier. Right inside, as you can see, <sighs> check it out, back seat. Also, uh, apparently, uh, it has a, a sunroof, really, really nice sunroof, right? But the back seat, this is really what I'm super pumped about. For the last two cars that I've had, so literally for four and a half years, I haven't had a back seat. My first car, the uh, the M4, that was a little bit, little bit better of a back seat, but the uh, M850i had no legroom, so literally I couldn't drive with anybody. The good news, like I've said before, is that I don't have friends. But one of the things I want to do moving forward in the upcoming year is actually get some more friends and possibly go on a road trip. Um, that is one of the other things that I'm really excited about this car. I get to actually take it on a road trip to Florida. And you're like, yo, that's so stupid. Why, did, why couldn't you take your other car to Florida? And the reason, honestly, is because of the tire situation, right? This car actually is a spare tire. My other cars, um, the BMW M4 and the 850, they didn't have like spare tires. And so if I were driving to Florida, right, you drive down some like crazy, like backcountry Alabama roads. And I always think to myself, I'm like, all right, if I get a flat tire in my M850, right, I'm on a run flat, but you only get like 50 miles. So I'm like, okay, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go get a new tire? Well, unfortunately, and the problem with low profile tires is that not every tire shop actually can handle it. And so there I am thinking, if I go to Florida, I get a flat tire, I literally, am 100% screwed and so we would never drive my car pretty much anywhere and so this car spare tire back seat awesome something else that's awesome is the trunk space really great trunk space all right something else about the car I have loved it I I'm actually surprised at how much I like it. I think I like driving this better than pretty much any car I've ever owned um, as you can tell it may or may not be an SUV um, and, uh, you know, I haven't had an SUV since my Toyota RAV4, which was one of the greatest cars of all time. And, um, you know, ever since then, it was the Toyota RAV4. And then my next car was the Infiniti G35, which I had for like 10 years. I gave it to my stepdad because he needed a car. And then I got the BMW M4. And then I bought another BMW, the M850. And now, as you can tell, another BMW. Now you're thinking to yourself, yo, is this dude like just really into BMWs? And the answer is no. I'm into my sales guy, Travis. What I mean by that is I want to buy cars from him, you know, and he has been, and this is kind of like the first like business lesson of, of today. And that is if you are a great salesperson, you will have people that want to come back and buy from you just because they like you. And with Travis, ever since I bought the first car, he has done an incredible job of just staying in touch with me and being a great dude. You know, anytime I have a question, anytime I have a problem, I'm shooting him a text, but he's let me know, hey, anything you need, let me know, I'm your guy. And so not only have I bought, you know, literally three cars from him in the past like four and a half years, 
I've sent people to him to actually get cars because a lot of people don't have the greatest buying experience when it comes to automobiles. And so if you guys are ever in the market for a BMW and, and I actually like kind of hype them up a little bit in the vlog that you're, go you're gonna watch on Thursday, um, if you guys are interested or need a BMW, guys, I'm gonna link to Travis's info down below. He can help you regardless of where you actually live. Um, right now, the inventory is horrible. And so if you are interested in getting any type of a BMW, you ha literally have to like order it or build it. Now, my car got here in like four weeks, right? I designed it, I built it because it is actually manufactured in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And so I also thought that was kind of cool, you know, supporting a you know, it's yes, a, a, a foreign car company, but they're manufactured here in, in the States, not too far from Atlanta. Anyway, um, Travis is just a perfect example of if you have great, amazing customer service and you provide a great experience, you are going to have customers that come back. And I, I was talking to Travis, I'm like, Travis, I'm like, you're so good. And he's one of the youngest people at the dealership. There are a lot of people that are much se more senior than he is. And um, I said, like, where do you rank in terms of the salespeople here at this dealership? It's Global Imports BMW in Atlanta right off of 285. Travis is the number one or number two selling or grossing uh, salesman at this dealership. And the thing that's really amazing about it is that the majority of his business is actually repeat. And so another, once again, it's just another story to, if you provide an excellent sales experience for somebody, they're gonna come back and that makes your job so much easier in the future, you don't have to sell, keep selling new people. It's all about developing that relationship, making sure that you're providing excellent customer service and it's just, it's a testament to, you know, I think I'll probably, you know, like always buy a BMW, whether or not it's for me or my wife or whoever, you know, because I want to buy a car from Travis. And so are there other cars out there that I, you know, think are awesome? Yeah, but it's not Travis. And so, you know, like I said, I'm not a huge car guy. Apparently I'm a, a more of a car guy than I realized because when I went in and I sat down and did all of the paperwork and we we're talking about what I was ordering, um, I was like, hey, you know, I, I want a really low payment. They're like, okay. And, and so I built this car and they're like, you know, they showed me what the, the lease was going to be. And I'm like, well, couldn't we get it like a little lower? I wanted it a little lower. And they're like, we can get you a lower payment, but it's going to be this car, this model, whatever. Like we can make it work for whatever you want in terms of payment. And I'm like, all right, it's literally, this car is uh, over $50,000 less expensive than my other one. And so my monthly payment dropped. Like we, like I have mentioned before, one of the main reasons is because I am building a house and I want to save my pennies. I'm a house guy. I'm not a car guy, but this car that I got, I'm really excited because A, it's kind of sexy and B, it's really fun to drive. It's honestly the most fun I've had driving a car in a really long time or ever possibly, but we'll see. I don't have a great track record with cars, so I may end up hating this in another six months. I don't think so. But anyway, gentlemen, there was a business question from last week's vlog that is incredible that I'd like to dive in now, dive into now. So actually there are two questions. One question is from the previous week and I asked Michael to clarify what he was asking because the, the question that he asked me in the previous vlog, it was a little bit, I just, I didn't understand. But here's the deal, gentlemen, if you've got a business question down below, start it with business question and ask your question. Each week I try to get to a few of your questions because this vlog is all about helping you along your entrepreneurial journey. Anyway, Michael's question is basically, um, what advice or tips do you have to somebody starting a men's lifestyle or grooming company that would help them stand out from the rest since the market is becoming more saturated with these type of companies? So, you know, this is a great question. In terms of a men's lifestyle company, you know, lifestyle is kind of all over the boards in terms of what it actually means. It could mean a, a sunglass company. It could mean an apparel company. It could mean, you know, really, it's all over the boards. Men's lifestyle is very broad in terms of a topic. Um, it could also mean you want to basically just be in the business of giving advice, giving help, giving sort of tutorials to guys to feel better, look better, like I do kind of on YouTube. That is, in my opinion, kind of like a lifestyle business. I get sponsorships. It's, you know, it's a business. And the other thing that he asks is a grooming company, all right, like T. Shanley or Pete and Pedro. And so um, what I would recommend 
if you are looking to start a business right now from, from like zero, is you got to figure out what, and, and, and to stand out from the crowd, what you got to figure out what is your value proposition? What is the thing that makes you different than these other companies? Now, it could be your personality, it could be your advertising, your marketing, your products. Is there something that you're doing a little bit differently? T. Shanley, the way that we stood out when we started T. Shanley is that it was a subscription. You know, it was also a system. It really boiled down to that system. Everybody else up until that point was selling, you know, one-off like grooming products, like the Jack Blacks and the Baxters. But when we started, we thought, you know what? It's not good enough to go into a store and just see a bunch of products. If we can give people exactly what they need in the sizes that they need, give them a one month subscription or service. Do I have it here? I have it here. Hang on, wait for it. And then the thing that really I think was a game changer for us was this instruction card. It's not good enough for us just to tell people, hey, use this, use this, use this, and you'll be handsome. We need to take it one step further in terms of simplicity and standing out from the crowd. And so we included this little instruction card, as you know, tells you exactly what time of day to use what product, in what order, and even how much. I remember sitting there with a plate, right, with our scrub, our AM, our PM, our moisturizer, our wash, and squeezing out the amounts that we were trying to say a dime size or a nickel size or a quarter size on a plate to see if I could get 30 uses. It was all about that 30 day cadence. And so this I really feel is kind of next level in terms of really breaking it down and making it as user friendly as possible. But that was kind of like our value proposition. Plus this vlog, another thing that helped us stand out from the masses. It was something that we could do on a weekly basis to basically allow people into you know, our world and share with them the experiences that we're having along with sort of the struggles and the hardships that we go through as we are starting a business. And so like you saw on the Shark Tank pitch on last vlog, you know, when we opened the doors day one, we literally had 1,000 people that signed up. And the reason is pretty simple. It wasn't that I was going on YouTube and talking about it on my Alpha M YouTube channel. It was the vlog. It was you guys. It was because we were giving value and talking about the process for like six months, eight months. I don't even remember exactly how long we were, we were doing this before we actually launched. We had built a community. And so that was something else that nobody else had done up until this point. And so it's all about figuring out what is going to set you apart from the masses. Yes, there are tons of people out there, but, or different companies out there. But the truth is we buy things differently now than we used to. In the old days, you basically, if you were a company, you were going to win if you had the most advertising dollars. You could put television commercials, magazine articles, billboards, right? Whoever had the biggest budget would win the marketing war. Now it's totally different. Now we buy from people that are like us. We buy from people and brands that we connect with and resonate with. And that's the other reason why T. Shanley has been so successful. It's because we resonated with people. It's me. It's us. We're talking to you. It's not the Jack Blacks. It's not the Baxters. It's not the Bulldogs. You know me. You know Rob. You know Kelly. You have met us. And so that's the reason why, you know, a lot of people feel comfortable buying from us. Not to mention, you know, we, we basically walk the walk and, and have created a company that has incredible products and a great value proposition. Offer people affordable prices, great products, exceed their expectations. That's how you're going to stand out from everybody else. And the last business question is from our friend Marvin K. Mooney. This question is so good and I don't even know that I'm qualified to talk about it, but it is just a great question. He says, some entrepreneurs will turn a profit almost from the start, but the vast majority won't. Making a loss at the beginning of a new business is simply the price to pay for growth, which is a lot of times, the majority of the times, true. But what are the warning signs to look, for, look out for that you're just throwing away good money? How can, you, uh, how can you know if the problem is your business strategy or your execution, which can be fixed, or simply the bad business and you should call it a day and stop bleeding money? Wow! <laughs> This question kicks so much ass because it is the, it's the million dollar question literally. And it's something that Kevin O'Leary and I actually talked about. If you guys saw the video that he and I did um, when I went and interviewed him and we talked a little bit about businesses, 
Um, you know, one of the things that he will always say on Shark Tank, and he said in person, is you got to know when to take it behind the barn and shoot it, right? Put the business down. His rule of thumb is three years. If you have been doing something and trying something and strategizing and developing your business for three years, and at that point, you're not actually making a profit, there's something fundamentally wrong with your business. Now, is it the business message? Is it the model? Is it the product that you're actually selling? And I really feel like that is an incredible, it's a hurdle, right? Because as an entrepreneur, a lot of times when you do a business, you love it. You think it's amazing. You're messaging. You think it's incredible. One of the best things and pieces of advice I can give you is you got to make sure that you've got great friends that are going to be honest with you. Whenever you approach somebody and ask them, you know, hey, what do you think of my idea? You know, if they're, you know, your family member, if you're your friend, if they don't have the ability to be honest and tell you, yo, it's a dog, it sucks, why would anybody buy this? You know, unfortunately, a lot of people surround themselves with people that are like, yeah, it's a great job because they don't want to hurt your feelings. You know, what really hurts is having a business that doesn't succeed. Yes, in the, big, in the beginning of any business, you know, depending on your business, depending on your model, depending on how you're acquiring customers, a lot of times you will go into the red but it's about each month figuring out and systematically analyzing the data, right? It's all about the data. And so if you are spending money and you're not seeing an upward tick, if you're not seeing your customer acquisition costs going down, if you're not seeing like little successes along the way, then there's something fundamentally wrong. Is it your business? Is it your product? How are the reviews? Do people love your product? When they buy it, do they love it? Do they refer a friend? Do they tell other people about it? Do they rebuy it? Or is it a once and done type of thing? The reviews are critical. You know, getting reviews, getting peer affirmation that your business, your product is great is one of the most important things that you can do up front. Whether or not you're starting a business selling cell phones, you're selling coffee, you're selling eyewear, you're selling a service, the reviews are what customers are living and dying by. Thanks to Amazon, right? If you go to a product and you don't see many reviews, many five-star reviews, you know, you're like, well, if this isn't really a good product or I don't know, I don't have that buy-in yet. And so you won't spend the money. And so one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is right up front, you need to have some mechanism to facilitate the review process. You know, T. Hanley has it, Pete and Pedro has it, even Amazon. If you're selling products on Amazon, you know, you have different softwares or there are different um, programs, services that will actually you know, facilitate you getting reviews after you make a purchase or after somebody purchases your product. And so really trying to boost up the reviews just to prove to other people that your product is worthy and that it actually lives up to the expectations. The reviews have to be verified reviews. You know, because I think in the old days, a lot of people could have like friends and family go on and review it and be like, yeah, it's awesome. And then you, know, you get it and you're like, yo, this kind of sucks. Verified reviews are critical. Um, so there are different mechanisms and methods to sort of track success and really you've got to define for yourself what your measure of success is. But really it does, in my opinion, it boils down to the numbers. You've got to have a way of tracking. What is your tracking in terms of spend, your customer acquisition cost, you know, are people engaging with your product? You know, what are those metrics in order to, you know, make it a success and, and, and validate your ideas, you know? And so I think that that's the other thing. If you're not seeing any type of uptick in sales and you're trying different methods, mechanisms in order to generate sales, there may be something wrong. Is it your product? Listen to your customers, pull your customers. Because, you know, for us, I'll give you another T. Shanley example. You know, once you get it out in the wild, you know, when you're conceptualizing it, everything is perfect. But once you get it out there, you gotta let your customers kind of tell you, hey, this is broken, this isn't right, you can fix this, or this would make it better. You know, with T. Shanley sizes, right? When we threw it out there, we, we assumed that we got the sizing right in terms of, okay, if you use it the way that we say to use it, it's gonna last you 30 days. It was always designed to be a 30-day system. But then, once it got out there, we realized that some people use products differently. They, they use them different quantities at different cadences, and so there were things that we needed to do. One of the things was increase the size of our wash. The size of our wash was too small, and so we bumped it up half an ounce to help compensate for the people that were saying, yo, it's not enough. The other thing we did to help people use it the way that they want to use it, we allowed people to go in and customize their delivery cadence and frequency. Now, that wasn't enough. 
And so we realized that, okay, let's keep listening to the customers, getting the feedback. And what we realized is that some people just weren't using the system the way that we designed it and intended. And so what are we going to do? Are we going to force people to use it this way? Or are we going to allow them to have even more flexibility in order to basically build the system that they want and use it the way that they want? And so we now allow people to actually add and drop and really customize it as much as you want. You know, and so this is just an example of how once you get it in people's hands and they start using it, you need to adjust and tweak. And as a company, T. Shanley, we've been at this for five years and we're still learning. We're interviewing our customers. You know, it always is, it's a process and it's something that you really need to, you know, have your eye on the pulse. Um, in terms of spending, you know, bad money, a lot of companies, when they raise money, get really sloppy with their spending. When you're bootstrapping, and I, I cannot say enough about you know, the importance of bootstrapping your company if you can afford it. Now, some companies need investment in order to grow, but if you can figure out that mechanism in order to scale, in order to get, okay, here it is, ready? I'm gonna leave you with this question. If you, okay, when do you raise money? If you know how, if you, somebody gives you a million dollars, okay, let me back up. <laughs> I'm all over the boat, okay. You should not raise money if you do not know how you are going to use that money, say a million dollars, all right? How will you spend this million dollars to grow exponentially or make more value for your company with this million dollars? That didn't make any sense, did it? What I'm trying to say is, don't raise money if you don't know how you're going to use that money in order to grow your business. A lot of companies think, oh, I'm gonna use it on marketing, but you really don't have the marketing like dialed in. Or, oh, I'm gonna use it on employees, but you don't know what employees you're gonna need. And then based on that, how are those employees going to help move the needle? You know, there really needs to be a one-to-one -one correlation, if you can, and how you spend each dollar and how that dollar is gonna come back to you. You really need to boil it down to the numbers. The numbers, the numbers, the numbers. With Tish Hanley, I know I'm running long on this vlog. With T. Shanley, one of the things that we really struggled with in the beginning was, was the analysis, right? We didn't have all of the data. We weren't analyzing because at the beginning, customer acquisition was easy. It was also free because I was doing everything. And so we're like, yes, this is awesome. But then when we started really looking at it, it's like, oh shit, we're losing a lot of people. We need to fix this. Well, when everything was great and I was the one that was feeding the funnel and everything was like just like up, you know, everything's good, but when things flatten out, that's when you really are like, yo, there's a problem, we gotta fix this or solve this problem. And so, incredible question. Unfortunately, there isn't a simple solution. But if you take Kevin O'Leary's advice, three years. If you're not seeing growth, or you're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of, of success, after three years, it's probably time to shoot that dog. Uh, but it's up to you. It's really hard to do, though, because a lot of people you know, it's hard to admit, okay, it's time to move on. But for me, you know, here's another example, my fitness center. If I could have kept that going another 10 years by selling organs like my kidneys, I would have done it. It was the fact that I had to stop because I didn't have any other option. But that was the best experience and decision that I ever made. Because from this bad decision, horrible, worst case scenario, everything in my life got better. And you know, they say when the, when, when the universe shuts a door, you know, maybe there's a window, look for a window that's open. And that's kind of what happened. You know, the fitness center, I had to shut the doors, but there were windows that started opening and it was me just experimenting and exploring and, um, and trying things that I was interested in that, that basically created all this. Gentlemen, we love you more than our dub monk strap shoes. You gotta promise me to watch the video on Thursday about the car vlog. I need views. Gentlemen, thank you. If you got a business question down below, start it with business question and ask it, you're amazing.